Thank you all so much for having us back here for now the third time, I believe. So we must be doing something right. Let me just get set up here. Briefly, I believe I've met most of you um, during the one time we've been here before, back in March or uh, summer of last year. For those of you who don't know or I haven't met or are new here, my name is Garrett Burke. Uh, this is my wife, Jessica, in the back here, right behind, yes, <laughs> smiling. And the newest addition to our family, uh, Jason, who is so stoked to be here, you can tell. So, yes, the Lord, Lord richly blessed us this last summer with Jason's arrival on June 11th. Uh, the only problem is he wasn't due until August 9th. So, he was so excited to uh, meet us and come into the world, he decided to show up two months early. He gave us all a bit of a scare and a lovely summer in the NICU. But, other than that, he's doing amazing, he's healthy, uh, he's in the top percentiles, in fact, on everything, um, size-wise and everything. His head circumference is like 85, so <laughs> he must be really smart. So <laughs> we're grateful for that. We're grateful that God has blessed us and blessed our family. Um, so thank you for your thoughts and prayers. Um, I know you, many of you are on our email update list that you get um, our updates each month. So thank you for your prayers and words of encouragement in this time. It's been a joyous season, both in our family and our ministry work as well. Um, again, for those of you who may not know, uh, my wife and I work with an organization called Campus Ambassadors. We do ministry on campuses throughout the U.S. We work out of Salem, Oregon. Uh, we spent a couple years serving at Willamette University um, during our support raising time, and we're preparing for full-time service at Chemeketa Community College uh, coming up here in January. So it's a bit of a transition time. We're also looking um, to launch a new ministry in over the next several years at Western Oregon University out in Monmouth. So working on having the whole Salem area covered because there's so many unreached students every single day. Um, many of you are probably aware that the age 18 to 29, year after year, is the most unchurched, the most unspiritual age demographic in the country. And most students, uh, when asked, say they were never prepared for, um, to maintain their spiritual life or to defend their faith when they went to college. So many of them are coming unprepared and unequipped to defend their faith, to share their faith, and to encourage others in the faith. So the need continues to arise every day, and God's richly blessed us with opportunities to serve day after day. So if you'd like to learn more, we will be available in the back afterwards. We have our newsletters. We have some more information about ourselves and about the mission as a whole. If you're interested in learning um, how you can pray for us, learning about some of the students in particular that we've been working with, some of the stories from this last semester, and also how you can uh, encourage us and su help support the work we do as we finish out our fundraising right now, please feel free to talk to us. We'll stay as long as we need, as long as this little guy allows, I guess I should say. So I'd love to share more with you guys afterwards. Now will you join me in a word of prayer as we look into God's word today. Father, we are grateful, Lord, that as we have just celebrated here recently, we are grateful that you have come, that you have made yourself known, that you have not um, left us to guess your will, that you have not left us to try to figure it out, but you have revealed it to us. You have revealed it to us in the person of your Son, Lord. And we are grateful for all the ways in which you do so. We're grateful for your revelation. We are grateful for your word, and we, we thank you for the privilege of being able to gather together and examine it in depth. And we pray that we would not take this task lightly. I pray that the words that, that I speak would not be of my own doing, but be of your spirit moving through me, Lord. And we thank you for that opportunity. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together as your body and to know you more. We thank you, Lord, and we give you the praise that you alone are due. Bless us in this time, and bless this time to your name. Amen. So three days ago, um, as has been mentioned, we celebrated the birth of our Savior. We celebrated Christ coming to earth, the joyous celebration of the incarnation of God becoming man for our sake. We celebrated Christ born into humanity for the ultimate sake of our redemption, for the sake of bringing about reconciliation between man and God. Christ came to destroy the enmity, the division that was between us and the Father that was a result of sin, and to make us both justified in a legal sense and sanctified in a sense of holiness um, before Him and before the Father. So today we're going to be examining uh, the law of God. We're going to be examining Jesus' description of the law and description of Himself as the fulfillment of the law in Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. Now some might think this is a little bit of an odd timing. Because the law and Christmas aren't two things that we normally put together. 
We don't often associate the law. We don't often associate the old covenant with Christmas. We view Christmas and the celebration of Christ's coming as a new time, as a time when God is doing things new. And that's certainly true. But as Christ himself states here in Matthew 5 to the crowds that are gathered, to the scribes and the Pharisees, to his apostles, that do not think I have come to abolish the law. I have come to fulfill the law. So Christ, in coming to earth, has a great task ahead of him. One of those tasks is the fulfillment of God's law, the perfect fulfillment of God's law that man could not do. And the law, as we'll examine today, shouldn't be something that's feared or dreaded or looked down upon. Rather, it's a glorious thing that we should be blessed we've received from God and that still has application to us today as New Testament believers. So, um, one of my favorite Christmas hymns of all time uh, Christmas slash Advent hymn is the classic Latin uh, text translated into English in the 18th century, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Did you guys sing that during Advent here? Okay, I, f I figured a few times you did. It's one of my favorites because not only is it a celebration of Christmas, but it's the anticipation of Christ's coming. You put yourself in the position of uh, intertestamental or New Testament Jew who is waiting, long awaiting the, the promised Messiah to make things right, to restore Israel, to restore the children of God, and to bring about deliverance of God's people. It's just that, that longing to say, God, how much longer? When will you make things right? They looked at this Messiah as the one who would be the perfect fulfillment of God's promise to his people. And one of the texts here in O Come Emmanuel, it reads, and I won't try to uh, sing it. I'll spare you the, the uh, horror of having to listen to me sing it, so I'll just speak it. But I'm sure you can picture the music to it as well. It says, O come, O come, thou Lord of might, who to thy tribes on Sinai's height, in ancient times didst give the law in cloud and majesty and awe. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. So, Again, we're taken back to the giving of the law initially at Sinai, this glorious, wonderful thing that has a very real application today, still. It had a very real application at the time of Christ's birth. And that, again, it's not something to be feared, but something to be revered and to appreciate greatly. We don't often associate Christmas as a time to reflect upon this, but we often associate Christmas as a time to celebrate God's grace, which we see as being contrary to the law. We sort of set up this dichotomy uh, of you either have grace or you have the law. And where there is more grace, there is less law. And the law served a purpose. It, it, it served a purpose in its time, but it's now been replaced by something better and doesn't apply to us. So we want to look at what Christ himself has to say about that today. And realizing that the reason for his coming is not to abolish the law. The reason for his coming is to fulfill the law perfectly. And what do we mean by the law today? Because it has many different applications that we sometimes get confused and um, don't quite understand. So we're going to examine that today. I just want to ask you guys a question to start with, and you can kind of think about this silently. What does this phrase, law and gospel, mean to you when you put those two together? Because it's one that I hear quite a bit among a lot of different Christian circles. In fact, I was recently asked to do an exam for one of my church committees, and one of the questions on there, word for word, says, what does the statement mean to you when it says every good sermon should have both law and gospel? And I contemplated that for hours of, A, what does it really mean? B, what do they want to hear me say? You know, what's the right answer in their eyes? <laughs> As you often have to consider. So, but that every sermon should have both law and gospel. Um, realizing that there is a great degree of interconnection. It's not one or the other. We, as, as, as Protestants, one of the rallying cries of the Protestant Reformation, in addition to sola scriptura, was one called tota scriptura, total scripture. All of God's revelation is equally valuable and equally valid and equally binding to the lives of us today. Certainly it's manifest in different manners than it was manifest to the people of ancient Israel, but it's still just as applicable. And if we ever fail to realize that and fail to live our life according to that, we miss out on God's ultimate purpose for our life, this side of heaven. So, what does the bearing of the law have on New Testament believers? Before we examine this any deeper, let's look back a little bit to the Old Testament. Let's look to the words of the psalmists and see what they thought about the law. See whether the law to them was a glorious thing or whether it was a burdensome thing. In fact, the very first words of the Psalter, Psalm 1, 1-2, we read, if you guys want to turn with me, 
We read, happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. Then again in Psalm 119, verses 1 to 3, we read, Happy are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Happy are those who keep his decrees and seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong but walk in his ways. And then in 119.97, we also read, How I love your law. It is my meditation all day long. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is always with me. And then we jump one book ahead to Proverbs, and we read Solomon in uh, Proverbs 29, 17 through 18, right? Discipline your children, and they will give you rest. They will give delight to your heart. Where there is no prophecy, people cast off restraint. But happy are those who keep the law. And these are just a few examples. There's, there's numerous other passages alluding to, to this reverence and, and joy that the people of Israel had for the law. It doesn't sound like it's something burdensome for them. Uh, it doesn't sound like it's something that they really would rather not have. They do it because they want to please God. They do it because they want to be right with God. But man, it's just a pain in the butt, and they'd really rather not have it. Rather, it's something they, they love. They meditate on day and night. They rejoice in the fact that God's given them the law. Because through the law, they can have intimacy with God unlike anybody else, unlike any other nation, unlike any other people. They can know him, and he can dwell among them. So do you think the people in 21st century America delight in the law, not even just the law of God, but in law in general, in the way that the people of Israel did? Or do you think we view law in general as a burden, something we wish we didn't have to have, something that's an unfortunate and necessary evil? Do you think that we rejoice in having the law of God and appreciate it in the manner that other people have throughout the centuries? Kevin DeYoung is a senior pastor at University Church in East Lansing, Michigan. He wrote a book called The Whole in Our Holiness, and he has a very good statement on the nature of the law and the gospel in Christianity today, or the law and grace. He writes, some Christians make the mistake of pitting love against law, as if the two were mutually exclusive. You either have a religion of love or a religion of law. But such an equation is profoundly unbiblical. DeYoung goes on to talk about, um, in an article published just last month on the Gospel Coalition, which I think captures part of the problem we have in wanting to, to hold the law in esteem, is of how we, we sort of segment what Jesus we want to receive today. We sort of break down, pick and choose the elements of Jesus' teachings, the elements of faith that we want. He wrote an article called, Who Do You Say That I Am? to borrow the phrase from uh, P Jesus' declaration to Peter in Matthew 16. In this article, De Young talks about the 16 different types of Jesuses, pardon my English here, of Jesus that our culture has created. He says, there's therapist Jesus, who helps us cope with life's problems, um, heals our past, tells us how valuable, how valuable we are and not to be so hard on ourselves. There's Starbucks Jesus, who drinks fair trade coffee, loves spiritual conversations, drives a hybrid car, and goes to film festivals. There's open-minded Jesus who loves everyone all the time no matter what, except for the people who aren't as open-minded as him. <laughs> There's touchdown Jesus who helps athletes run faster and jump higher than non-Christians and determines the outcome of Super Bowls. <laughs> the Seahawks must have outprayed the Broncos last year, so <laughs> at halftime. There's martyr Jesus, a good man who died a cruel death so we can feel sorry for him. There's gentle Jesus who is meek and mild, with high cheekbones, flowing hair, and walks around barefoot, wearing a sash, and looks German. There's spirituality Jesus who hates religion, churches, pastors, and doctrine. He wants you to find God within you and listen to spiritually ambiguous music. There's also platitude Jesus, hippie Jesus, yuppie Jesus, uh, guru Jesus, boyfriend Jesus, and good example Jesus, just to name a few. So... The point here is that we've all been guilty. This isn't just something that the secular culture does. Even we as a church have been guilty of picking and choosing the Jesus that we like and the elements of Jesus that we like. Some of us say we really love the Jesus of grace, but we hate the Jesus who says, I've come to fulfill the law, and not one iota, not one note of the law will disappear until heaven and earth disappear. Jesus, when you think about it, in one way, is one of the most paradoxical figures in all of history. Because if you want to receive Jesus, if you want to receive the person of Christ, you have to receive the Jesus who said both love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, but then also said just five chapters later, I have not come to bring peace but a sword. 
I've come to set a man against his father and a daughter against his mother. Both things came out of Jesus' mouth, said both with the same level of authority. You also have to accept that Jesus, who willingly gave up his life on the cross and prayed for his tormentors, but also angrily drove out the money collector or the money changers and merchants who are defiling the temple. Both of these, these elements of Jesus we have to receive if we want to know him more, if we want to know him fully. We can't pick and choose which parts we want to receive. We can't pick and choose sweet baby Jesus while ignoring the Jesus who says, I've come to fulfill the law and vows to punish those who refuse to do so. So why is it that anti-legalism or antinomianism, if you want to get Greek on it, um, is so prevalent in churches today? The doctrine that says we have grace so we don't need the law. We have grace so the law doesn't apply to us anymore. The Israelites didn't have grace, so they needed the law. They were imperfect. We have a better covenant. We have a covenant of grace. We just screw up, we pray, we're forgiven, and all is well. Well, for one thing, the reason why this is so popular is because it's pleasing to hear. It's a lot more pleasing to hear than saying, keep the law. Now, before, before we go further, before you get out the pitchforks and torches and want to drive me out of town, you might be wondering, is he advocating works-based salvation? Let me say, no, I am not. And for those who know me, you know it's anything but that. That I believe 100% that we are saved solely by the good graces of God, solely by God's good pleasure. But that doesn't mean the law has no application for us. Not in a salvific sense, certainly not. But in a very real, heartfelt sense, in knowing God more and desiring to know him by desiring to love his law. John Calvin, who is certainly no opponent of works-based salvation, probably the furthest thing from it, talks about the law. He talks about the threefold use of it um, and how it still applies to us under the New Testament, under the New Covenant. He talks about the law saying that, one, it's to serve as a mirror. He says the law gives us a small taste of the perfect righteousness of God, while at the same time revealing our own brokenness, our own need for his grace. In other words, you've heard the analogy that if you don't know that you're sick, you won't seek out a doctor. If you don't realize you're in need of care, you won't seek it out. So the law helps us realize how broken we are and helps us realize our absolute dependence upon God's grace by convicting us of our sin, by convicting us of our wrongdoing. The second purpose Calvin talks about is restraining evil, personal, individual evil, and societal evil. That while the law can't change human hearts, only the grace of God can do that, it can help prevent injustice and suffering at the hands of the unrighteous. That the gospel has a very strong social element. Part of that social element is to curb human suffering, to promote societal flourishing, to promote comfort in this life as well, and to promote justice over injustice. It's not just as simple as saying, just change your hearts and everything will be right. Yes, the grace of God does transform hearts, but we also are a society of laws that help us function. So the law has a very strong societal value at the same time. Third, he talks about the law reveals what is pleasing to God. Jesus, in John 14, 15, in the Upper Room Discourse, says to his disciples, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. One chapter later, in, verse, in chapter 15, verse 10, he states, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. To love God is to keep his commandments. To love Christ is to do what he calls us to do. God makes it possible for us to know what is pleasing to him. Even though we cannot fulfill it perfectly in this life, even though we are totally dependent on grace, he makes it possible for us to know. He doesn't, again, he doesn't um, leave us to guess. He doesn't leave us to wonder what he wants. He says, this is what is desiring to me. This is what pleases me. This is how you can have intimacy with me. This is how you can have covenant relationship with me. I revealed it to you, and by my grace, you will be able to accomplish it. So let's consider the initial giving of the law at Sinai. Take yourself back 3,000, 3,500 years ago um, to the people of Israel being brought out of torment and trial in Egypt. God has delivered them to Sinai. It was given in the context of God establishing his covenant with his chosen set-apart people, saying, I have brought you out, I have redeemed you unto myself, I have kept my promises that I, the, that I swore to your forefathers, and now I will make you a nation. How did he do that? By giving them the law. 
The law allowed the Israelites to know God and experience fellowship with him unlike any other people. He says, I haven't given this to the Egyptians. I haven't given this to the Hittites or the Amalekites or all the other peoples around saying, you alone, I'm giving this to so that you can know what is pleasing to me so that you can have that covenant relationship with me. I have set you apart to know me more. It wasn't this thing that the Israelites got out and they said, oh man, we got to do all these things. We got to burn all these animals. We got to have all these festivals. You know, we got to ritually cleanse ourselves and all this stuff. It was this beautiful thing saying, yes, our God, our deliverer has given us this capacity to know him more out of his love for us. Now, certainly they screwed up time after time after time. And many of them completely missed the point of the law, which is heart transformation. As we'll, we'll read later, as Jesus talks about the Pharisees and their notion of what it means to follow the law. But the law wasn't something they hated. It wasn't something that they looked down upon and wasn't this burdensome thing. It was, it was an exciting thing. They, they respected it and they revered it as God was giving it to them. The problem is, as I mentioned, many of them, time after time, missed the entire point of the law. It wasn't a set of external acts. Those external acts were used as a guide to help bring about transformation of your heart and surrender to God. Paul, who I always believe understands sanctification infinitely better than I ever could, writes in Romans uh, 2, 25-27 regarding those who claim that they were children of Abraham because they were circumcised. Well, he writes to them saying, Circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So, if those who are uncircumcised keep the requirements of the law, will not their circumcision be regard will not their uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then those who are physically uncircumcised but keep the law will condemn you that have the written code of circumcision but break the law. So Paul makes the point here that the law is good. The external aspects of the law, like circumcision, are good for those who keep it and for those who are truly circumcised of heart. But if you're simply performing the external acts, if you're going through the motions, but your heart is distant and cold to God, it's of absolutely no benefit. And it's a waste of time. And it's a burden that you're just heaping upon yourself for no benefit, no reason whatsoever. Jesus is responding to those who claim that he's offering a system contrary to the law. We read in uh, 517, he says, Do not think, as some of you have said, little aside, that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. So obviously there is a speculation already that people are starting to say, there's this guy out there, he's preaching these crazy things, he's saying to do away with the law of Moses, this guy is crazy. And so Jesus is obviously aware of what's being said about him, and he responds to it. This is a direct response to those who were making these accusations against him as, as they thought he was trying to do away with the Mosaic law. Then in verse 18, he says, Truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away. So when he says, truly I tell you, the word he actually uses is amen. It's, it's just transliterated right from the Hebrew word. So it means certainly, be certain of this. It's, it's the most affirmative declaration of certainty he could have made. That rest assured of this. Not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until it is accomplished. The word that he uses here, as we read this morning, uh, is one iota. Not one iota of the law will be done away with. How many of you guys have heard the phrase, it doesn't make one iota of difference? Okay. It's, it's a fairly common vernacular. So, Jesus, using that phrase here, he's using the term iota because in Greek, the letter iota, which is translated in English as I, is the tiniest letter. It's just a single little dash. And in Hebrew, the equivalent is the letter yod, which is even tinier. It's a little teeny tiny, almost like an inverse colon. So it's the smallest of all Hebrew letters, the smallest of all Greek letters. And he's saying not even the smallest of all the letters written in the law will pass away. And then he takes it one step further. He says not even the tiniest dot on the stroke of one of those letters will be done away with of the law. So that's the level that he wants us to realize. I've not come to abolish the law. I've not come to do away with it. I've come to fulfill it perfectly. 
just a little aside on the iota story, um, that phrase, it doesn't make one iota of difference, is born partially here, but partially comes out three centuries later at the first um, church council at Nicaea. Um, for those who may not be familiar, the Council of Nicaea was convened to address the heretical teachings of Arianism, which said that Jesus was not eternally God, it said he was a created being, he had a beginning. So as opposed to Orthodox Christianity, which says Jesus is eternal, he's part of the triune Godhead. Well, the Orthodox Christians um, claimed that Jesus is what they called homoousius. The word homoousius means of one substance that he is of one substance with the Father, that he is of one essence as the Father. Whereas the Arians like the term homo iousius, which means of like or similar substance of the Father, but not of the same substance. So in that case, one iota in the, in the middle of that word made a huge difference. So that's where you get that phrase from, and that goes back to demonstrate how even one single iota makes a huge difference, but not one iota will disappear from the law. So, if that question ever comes up on Jeopardy, you can thank me for it. <laughs> and give me a percentage of the winnings. Anyway, so Jesus goes on to talk about, um, in verse 19, he says, Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. If someone has disdain for God's law, he cannot call himself an apostle of Christ. So, the logical question might arise that some uh, critics of the Christian faith or even some more liberal branches of Christianity will raise is, does this mean we shouldn't eat pork? Or that we shouldn't eat um, bacon cheeseburgers? Or that we shouldn't knit a uh, sweater together with the wool of two different animals? Or that adulterers should be stoned to death? Or all these other things you see in the Levitical law. They say, well, what about this, this, and this? Well, we don't have time to break that all down today, but just a brief note on that. This is where we have to differentiate between what's known as the ceremonial laws for ancient Israel, such as the, the sacrificial system, the system of festivals and other stuff, and then the moral law, which is based in moral precepts which presuppose that, which supersede the covenant that God made with the people of Israel, such as respect for human life, respect for others' property, um, sexual purity, all these things which have principles that go beyond the particulars of the Levitical law. And also we have to look at the principial application of a law. What I mean by that is, for example, in the Levitical law you're required to have a parapet around your roof. A parapet is a, a fence around, that went around your rooftop in your house. The reason for this is because it routinely got very, very hot, triple digit temperatures in ancient Israel, so at nighttime you go up to the top of your house to cool down. And if your guest walks up there to cool down and accidentally walks off the edge of your roof in the dark and dies, you're held liable, you're held accountable for their death. So if you don't have that fence to ensure that life is protected, you're held accountable. Well, here in 21st century America, I don't know too many people who go up to their rooftop in the summer to cool down. We have air conditioning, we have swimming pools, we have other means. but if you do own a swimming pool and you don't put a fence around it to keep it safe and a neighborhood child wanders in there and drowns, you have not taken the proper steps to ensure that life is protected. So while the specific application may have changed, the principle of preserving and protecting life still very much applies and is still very much valid. So it's an example of how the principles of the Levitical law still apply today, even if the specific applications you know, may have changed. So we move on to verse 20, where Jesus says, For truly I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now some people want to take this verse as Jesus saying, don't do anything these guys do. Whatever they're doing, do the exact opposite. And to be fair, Jesus rightly condemns the scribes and the Pharisees time after time. Um, but in this one, it's not quite that simple. Jesus says, therefore, I tell you. So the therefore relates what he's saying here back to what he's talking about earlier, about keeping the law. So he says, these are some people who try to keep the law. And in some avenues, in, in some manners, they actually do a really good job. I mean, they are so strict about not taking a Sabbath day journey or not doing any work on the Sabbath and making sure all their, pro, their, their ties are in, um, keeping all the festivals. You know, in one sense, the Pharisees really had an appreciation for the law of God. 
But the problem is, Christ doesn't condemn the Pharisees for trying to follow the law. Christ properly condemns them for believing that righteousness could be obtained through the external law. While they honored God with their actions, with their lips, their hearts were far from him. As Isaiah once said, seven centuries prior to this, their hearts completely missed the point of what the law was designed to do. And at the same time, they had disdain for their fellow man and weren't seeking true intimacy with God. They were just seeking to get reward for the actions they did. So how then does one's righteousness in keeping the law exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees? Well, once again, I defer to Paul on this one. Who writes in Romans 6, 5, he says, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be destroyed, and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. Then in 1 Corinthians 1, 30, he also writes, quote, He, Christ, is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. It's not our righteousness that makes us right before God. It's the righteousness of Christ. We receive that righteousness in Christ's death. We receive that justification, which makes us right in a legal sense, and that sanctification, which makes us holy before God by virtue of Christ's death which we receive by faith. We receive the righteousness and sanctification of Christ by faith alone. That's why Christ came to fulfill the law, to be that perfect fulfillment of the law, that perfect righteousness that we could never be, that we could never obtain through our own doing. The uh, Reformed theologian Anthony Hochma writes regarding this subject, by faith we continue to grasp our union with Christ, which is the heart of sanctification. In regeneration, which is totally a work of God, we are made one with Christ and enabled to believe in him. But we continue to live in union with Christ through the exercise of that faith. Because of our sinfulness and our brokenness, the external law is powerless to bring about true transformation of the heart. But, praise God, Christ, who has fulfilled the law perfectly, has died so that our debt to God could be paid. The debt that we could never, ever hope to pay off because of our brokenness. But, again, Christ has not only made us justified in a legal sense, he's not only made it to where God has no legal case to condemn us, but he is making his children righteous by leading that perfect, sinless life for our behalf. And we receive that by faith. Not by anything that we can do, not by any external acts. We receive the righteousness of the one who followed the law perfectly. Not out of desire for reward, but out of obedience and love for the Father. Christ says, I keep my commandments to my Father because I love him. And if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Do we keep God's commandments because we love him or because we want to get reward? For many of the Israelites, for the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they kept it because they wanted reward. Not because they loved the Father, not because intimacy with the Father and knowing him was reward enough. Can that be our reward? Can that be our desire in desiring to be honoring and pleasing to God? and desiring to, to love and meditate upon his law. Martin Luther sums it up well when he writes, In terms of obedience to the law, there is a difference only in that those people who are not yet reborn do what the law demands unwillingly because they are coerced. Believers, however, do without coercion, with a willing spirit, insofar as they are born anew, with no threat the law could ever force upon them. Believers fall the law out of love. Believers do so without coercion, with a willing spirit, a spirit that says, I love you, Lord, and therefore I seek to keep your commandments. So, in closing, in this Christmas season, as we celebrate our Savior coming for our redemption, our Savior being born of a virgin for our sake, to restore and redeem his people, let's rejoice that God has not only given us the law, that we might know him more, that we might experience intimacy with him by following it, but let's rejoice even more so that it, by Christ perfectly fulfilling the law by virtue of his sinless life on earth, he has ensured us the righteousness that we could not obtain by our own doing. He has assured us right standing with the Father and assured us his holiness that we could not receive on our own. Amen.